Sean Gruhamid here from Loudwire, sitting amongst the flowers with none other than Sean Clown Cron from Slipknot. Thank you so much for your time today. I totally appreciate it. Thank you. So, we're going to clear up some stuff on Wikipedia that I found First today. First thing we'll clear up is Cran. Oh, Cran. I'm sorry. That's my fault. That's I just not thought, We'll fault. dig right into it. We'll dig right <laughs> okay. into it. So that's one notch against me. No, but there's there no notches. <laughs> we're just here to educate. Yes. And for the record, it's Cran. Cran. Get it Cran. right. Cran. Yes. All right. But it also says on there that uh, some people call you Kong. Actually, I've been waiting for this moment for a long time. Because it's uh, <clears throat> one thing with my career has and basically growing older. Mm -hmm. uh, I just try to be the best man I can be these days. And a lot of that is accepting a lot of things that um, I may have done when I was younger that I'm embarrassed about. And just realize that you know I've grown, and um, also admitting admitting to certain stories or certain things. Okay. Uh, and this one, this one's particularly, I guess, personal. It, it gets embarrassing because of the way people make it. But now I'm just fine because I've lost my mom. So this one's about my mother, who's passed. Uh, she would come to Slipknot shows before we were signed, and I was always just blowing up my drums and just flips and stage diving and a lot of blood and things and my mom would always say that I looked like a silverback gorilla uh, just on a rage because I had to play a lot of my drums bent over so uh, silverback okay. gorillas you know they're, they're bent over sure. and that's more or less what it was is that when we play our drums we're always hunched over kind of just throwing it down and my mom loved King Kong and that was something we shared together. I always had a King Kong poster in my room all the way up until adult days. Uh, so she just called me Kong and I remember one Christmas she bought me a, a, a crystal, a pure crystal silverback gorilla. Oh, wow. And you know, growing up with that story and stuff, I'd always, I'd always find, I don't know, it was the way people would bring it. It's my mom, it was personal. I'm, I'm an only child and I get embarrassed, but now, yeah. hell yeah, you know, my mom called me Kong, and it wasn't because I, you know, it was just because of some primal stuff, and she just associated with that, so. There you go, it's true, there and there's, it there's a beautiful story behind it as well. Uh, it says that uh, that you attended private schools as a child, and uh, as you said, that you have no siblings, and because of that, it says that you never really learned how to share. Uh, Come on, I mean, slip now. <laughs> you gotta share with eight other dudes. I gotta share all day, every day. All right. So that's so that'll be fiction, yeah, that's then, bogus. right? <laughs> all right, change it. Uh, it says that uh, when you were picking numbers for the band members, uh, you weren't going to tolerate any other member wearing number six. Uh, if someone was willing to fight you for it, you would have fought to the death. That's what it says verbatim. I already knew in my heart I would be number six. Okay. I had a feeling in my heart that if someone brought up number six, that we're going to have to have a, a, a conceptual battle and whoever was deepest with it, I would feel would bear that number. However, I knew if I took a deep breath and just let everybody express what they felt, it would work out, and it did. Everybody had what they wanted. Yeah. I mean, if you were to ask Mick, he would tell you at the time, if I remember right, that that was his lucky number, number seven. It was attached to it. So he really was passionate about getting it. Nobody else wanted that. It was, it was fascinating, but there was no, to the death, whatever, you know, that's just a matter of discretion. A little, a little more. Uh, it says in Slipknot's early years, you would bring pig's heads on stage. Uh, cow's heads. Cow, okay. Wrong animal. It sounded a little there, black metal. There was uh, a couple times a pig head okay. would have been uh, on stage, but I can honestly tell you I did not purchase or bring them, whereas if there were ever cow heads on stage, you get a little bit more bang for the buck. It's about $8 a head at that time instead of $6 a head and a much bigger piece of anatomy to work with. And so I brought clown, or cow heads. Beautiful. Uh, it said that you began wearing the clown mask as a joke uh, and that ended up actually spotting the mask idea. No, it was never a joke. Fiction, okay. 
fiction. Let's say it's too long of a story, but okay. That that when I when I release a book, sometime you know there will be a whole chapter on the awareness of that first mask that I wore that introduced it. You know my idea of everybody wearing it, and then being here so many you know over a decade later and still having it be something important. So that's a whole thing. But I had my mask since I was 14, the one that I wore okay. in 1999, and uh, so. Uh, it was always a very important thing. Couldn't tell you why. There was always a staple uh, statement. Sure. Uh, you mentioned a, a book. Is that something that you're looking to do in the yeah, near yeah. future? I was already supposed to put one out, but uh, really, I don't know. I don't like to hear my own stories. No. Not when there's okay. not when there's greats out there that have been doing it longer, harder, better in some instances. So I don't know. Maybe a couple more years, feel through. All right, cool. I, I'll be looking forward to that. Uh, it says that you coined the phrase maggots to your fans, and the meaning behind that is that the youth of Slipknot's fan base feed off the dead flesh of society. Well, I did dub it. Okay. Uh, but it's that uh, they feed off of Slipknot. Okay. So. so I used to study maggots a lot. Uh, there's always a lot of dead deer out by where I live. And, uh, and, uh, Randy Bly just skateboarding by us right now. Yeah, I'm just having a good old time working that hill. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, there was this one particular time I was filming a dead deer, and the maggots were in full effect, and they were concentrated on this area, and I would notice they were all vertical, and they were just tight as can be, like trees, just straight up and down. And when they had enough, they would let off of the flesh and they would let go and they would get on top and they would roll off. They would turn into these like little balls and roll off the, the deer onto the ground and then they would begin to crawl off. And I just love the fact of like, it looked like a bunch of kids just smashed together and then they were on top of each other. And that sounds a little like crowd surfing to me. Yeah. So I. But it was that they fed off of us. You know? Yeah. The Antennas to Hell compilation. Uh, on the inside, it says the CD tray features a photo of your blue house. False. Fiction. Okay. Uh, what it's, is it? It's Paul Gray's house. Wow. Okay. That's a big it's, falsehood. It's a big false. See, this is why these things are good. Yeah. Normally, I don't do shit like this. It's not because of Graham here and Cron and Cran. It's, Never made that mistake. No, again. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm having fun. Uh, Good. <laughs> it was important to me. That was uh, one of the first projects without Paul. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't without the gray. It was the very first audible kind of thought process where I was having to make art. There's some videos there and some remixes. And it's just a bunch of stuff to get through that time period. And that was the first time period without Paul Gray. Yes. So, I mean the band, we started the band together because he loved my art, so it's always my responsibility to have those parallel themes, those rabbit holes. So, I called up a really good friend of his and mine, who was there on the first record, who was also born in Los Angeles, and I had him go out on a disposable camera, on a digital camera, take pictures of Paul's apartment that he lived in, where he learned how to play guitar. And the one that you can see the number the most is the one that's him. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a beautiful shot because there's a flower and you see through the flower and there's his apartment. And that's where he had his white guitar and started to learn how to play Slayer and, you know, Pink Floyd and Dead Kennedys and all the other stuff that he yeah. loved. So I, I put that in there for a wormhole, you know. Absolutely. I know you spent a long time on that uh, album cover. Yeah, as well. that's actually yeah. some of the hardest work. I've ever done in my career. And I'm really proud of that. Some, In some instances, I wish it wasn't a live record, because live records just never get taken as seriously. It's just the way the mindset is. It's a different experience. Yeah. That's what I should say. It's not better or worse, it's just different. But I really went in on it. If you look at that, I really, I took some chances. And no one really talks to me about it, so I figure no one's either cares, because Arts in the Beholder are, Maybe no one's looking hard enough, I don't know. That's weird what people will actually focus on and what people will miss. But, uh, last one for you. Uh, 
the new musicians in the band. It said, uh, you and the rest of the band felt that it would be disrespectful for them to have their own masks, and that's why you guys uh, kind of gave them the same mask. Let me answer this differently. Okay. And then it's whatever. Let me give you a growing thing. Things are so good right now, you may ask yourself, God, in all those days we were worrying about things like their masks, and are they gonna wear numbers? Are they gonna be in photo shoots? Are we gonna tell people their names? What are they gonna do on stage? Ah, da, 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 all that crap. Well, I look at me right now and things are so great, and I think, God, did I need to worry? But the trick is, is that yes, we take all that stuff into account, and we think about it correctly, and we take those issues to heart, and we never make it about press, are the fans we make about us. And we did not feel it's like not only did we have to have a new bass player on stage, we had to have a new drummer. Yeah. So there was always talk. We used to have play without a bass player up front. Oh yeah, yeah. Alright, so but now we gotta have a drummer out front, so that means entertain the thought of a bass player. We had to think about that. Can the bass player still play behind? Because that was Paul and he's deceased. We had to take all of that shit. And then you think about things like the press, just trying to make a heyday of like, why that number, why that mask? So you know what, fuck it, you two, you're gonna wear the same mask. And just take all that negativity away, and when it's important for you to have an identity, you can express it to the whole world in a truthful fashion, and it'll be time to do that. Not at the beginning of a record cycle, when you're talking about your dead friend, yeah. and everybody's coming at you with the other story, and then you want to concentrate on these masks and these numbers, and all on stage. I'm here to play fucking music for kids and fans of all ages, and myself and my family. So, Slipknot does very well thinking about these big things, uh, and they are pretty drastic. If you talk to those new guys, you know sometimes their egos get bent because they're excited, and they want, and they they give it. And when they give it, it gives them a sense of pride and respect. And then that's when they come at us. You know, they're doing meet and greets now. They weren't in the beginning. Wow. Okay. But now it's a place. And they're passionate about, like, we should be allowed to do this. All right. Let's do it. It feels good because it was earned on their behalf, not me. I'm yeah. in the fucking band. I helped start it. I don't care. I'm glad they do it. I don't have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for sitting down with me. I really appreciate Thank it. You appreciate very your much, time. Man. Thank you. Sean Cran, everybody. Here's one request on Wikipedia. If it's going to be a thing in this world, if we're going to allow this thought process, which I've seen it from day one, I've watched it from day one that it was up, I have been there. And I, I think it's an interesting avenue. <clears throat> However, let's just get a little bit more legitimate with the truth. The truth is what's important. I'm willing to allow the truth, even if I get embarrassed with some of my actions. I gotta live with it, I gotta sit in it, I grew from it. But I'll allow it as long as it's true. So let's be a little bit more optimistic on thinking about, about making Wikipedia a little bit more truthful and a little less, a little less, uh, a clusterfuck. Yeah, a little <laughs> less preschool. All right, baby steps right here. Thank you again, I appreciate it. Right, Thanks a lot. Peace.